Oh, hey. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Town Peterson. This is our now 10th global online seminar in biodiversity informatics. I'm very, very happy to pick this up after our Christmas break, given that Christmas was right on the last Thursday of the month last month. Um, just to give you, a, you all a couple um, operational points, Next month's seminar will also be coming from Australia, um, but it will be held at a different time because our speaker was was uh, not wanting to be up at 2 a.m. like our present speaker is. Uh, <laughs> but that seminar is is on this new climate data archive called Climond, um, and that's actually from a request from one of our, our participants in the Facebook page who asked, couldn't we have a seminar about Climond? Um, so we will. The other thing is um, our big challenge with these online seminars is getting questions and answers going. Uh, our speaker is very willing to answer questions, but you have to get us the questions in time um, so that when he finishes up his seminar, there are some questions waiting. So if questions come to mind um, during the seminar, please go ahead and post them. You can either post them on the Google Plus page for this event, or you can post them um, to the training at gmail.com um, email address that we use for, for most of these, um, these communications. Anyhow, um, our speaker today is Dan Warren. Uh, Dan did his PhD work at UC Davis, University of California at Davis, and that's when I met him uh, because he and a, a couple colleagues wrote um, what I considered to be a very, very influential paper. And so I, I thought, this is somebody I really need to interact with. And I've greatly enjoyed interacting with Dan and, and his colleagues ever since. Um, and that paper has indeed been quite important in the development of this field. Um, now Dan is on the other side of the world at Macquarie University in Australia. He is supported on a Discovery Early Career Research Award uh, as a postdoc, and we'll see where he ends up eventually as a, as a professor and researcher. For the moment, however, Dan will be giving us a talk on what he titled The Future of Ecological Niche Modeling. So I am as intrigued as you will be to see what he has to say. Uh, Dan, all yours. All right, let me screen share here. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I I hope I'm doing this right. Am I? Is there any way I can know that? Yes, you're great. Okay. Cool. All right. Cool. All right. Thanks for 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 uh, joining us, everyone. So. Um, uh, I don't want to spoil the surprise, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what the future of niche modeling is. Um, but what I am going to talk about is, is I think, well, it, this this talk is kind of odd. It's 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 only about the last 15, 20 minutes of it is really a research talk, and the rest of it is kind of a a distilled version of a series of um, thoughts and minor existential crises I've had uh, with respect to uh, uh, this type of modeling and this literature and what we're doing over the past few years. So um, yeah, it is 2 a.m. here, so I'm going to be a little bit rambly and a little bit loopy, but I'll try and uh, restrain myself to the extent that I can. So um, given uh, the, the crowd here, I'm not going to really walk you through the intro to what niche modeling is, because I, I assume all of you pretty much know it. But I do want to just kind of say that what I'm talking about here is um, not really specific to any particular method. It's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's really about the kind of whole research program uh, that that's, uh, revolves around sort of taking occurrence data 
and environmental data and using that to uh, uh, build a quantitative model of species environmental tolerances which you can use to predict the suitability of habitat. So a lot of what I'm saying is going to be true for Maxent or GLIM or BRTs or, or whatever you like. Um, so it, it's, it's much more sort of general and conceptual than about any particular method. So, um, right, so you all know niche models. Um, of course, the first question when we're talking about the future of niche modeling is whether they have a future, and I think it's, it's pretty unambiguous they do. Certainly they have a recent past. Um, these things have really taken off in the past decade, uh, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Uh, they're used across ecology, evolution, conservation biology for a variety of purposes. Um, and yet there are still fairly massive uh, error bars around uh, uh, the estimates we make from these things. So I'm not going to, this is from a, a, a study that uh, uh, I was working on with Matthew Moskwick and Camille Parmesan and uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research and Rand Corporation. And uh, I'm not going to walk through the whole study here, but, but I want to make the point here. So we're sort of trying to figure out where uncertainty and the effects of climate change on uh, species that we care about comes from, and each one of these bars is a species, and the, 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 the total, the bar is the total uncertainty in the species, and then the little colors in each vertical bar are the proportion of that uncertainty that comes from different sources. And we're not going to walk through this here, but um, I just want to make the point here that the bottom blue bar uh, for each of these species, I don't know if you can see my arrow there, the bottom blue bar, that's the proportion of the uncertainty in what climate change is going to do to that species that's actually due to our uncertainty in climate change itself. So this little bar right here is what we don't, is how much of what we don't know about the future for this species that is due to our uncertainty in the actual direction and magnitude of climate change. And all of the rest of these things are the decisions we make in the ecological modeling process. So when you view this one way, it's kind of depressing because it says we know so much less about what we're trying to estimate than the climate modelers know about what they're trying to estimate, at least in the context of uncertainty. But it also means getting better at this modeling is important. And if we can actually do anything, to bring down our error bars, we can potentially sort of reap fairly large benefits in, in terms of making better plans for species that we care about. So um, the methods are very widely used. Uh, there's still a lot of problems with them, a lot of uncertainties about them, but that just means it's a really ripe field for methodological development. So because of that, because these are important, they're widely used, they're going to be widely used for the foreseeable future. Um, I feel like it's worthwhile to revisit some basic concepts here. And in particular, like I say, I've been having a series of minor existential crises about what we're, we're doing in this literature. And, and particularly, I've been thinking about how what we're doing and what we're trying to do uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, don't really match each other. So ideally, what we'd be doing uh, with these models and then what we actually are doing are quite distinct. So, here we go. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about terminology some, and I know probably most of you just sort of groaned internally a little bit because most of the time there's nothing less interesting or useful than a discussion of terminology. But in this case, I think actually some of the core issues that we're going to have to deal with going forward uh, are reflected in the uncertainty in the terminology. So I'm going to walk through my argument here about why these things are niche models, and then I'm going to try and make the case that you should actually care about that. And then I'm going to get to the sort of conceptual issues, I think, of what we're doing versus what we think we're doing, uh, uh, and, and uh, um, try and uh, make some points there, okay? And then um, finally, how I think we might need to move forward. And I also want to sort of I want to sort of throw out the caveat here that most of what I'm saying has been said before, but uh, um, I'm not sure it's, well, this is kind of my take on issues that you've probably thought about before and other people have thought about before, certainly. Uh, uh, and I think the kind of, uh, uh, when you put it all together, it sort of points out that we need to make some changes. Okay. Terminology, niche or distribution. Okay. First off, I feel like I have to throw a caveat out here in any discussion 
uh, of, of niche modeling, uh, which is that when I say I think we're modeling the niche, I don't want to be taken to, uh, uh, to mean that I think we're modeling it particularly well. Um, because often I think we're not with these methods. I'm not sure it's actually entirely possible with these methods to build a good model of the niche. But that's not really what the question is. The question is what are we trying to do? What do these models represent? And uh, I'm going to argue that it is the niche. But I, I just do want to put this in your head that you shouldn't take that to mean that I think we're necessarily doing it well. So I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, the BAM diagram, the Soberon and Peterson, Peterson, Soberon, various permutations thereof, which is this sort of idea that there's this abiotic niche we're trying to estimate, this big blue thing here. But we can only get data from the intersection of the abiotic niche with the biotic uh, interactions that are favorable and the dispersal limitations of the species. And so our data is going to look like this little yellow thing here. And that's going to limit our ability to infer the abiotic niche we'd like to know about. This is a very useful framework. Uh, it's been very productive, I think, for a lot of people. I think it, uh, to me, visually doesn't kind of represent what I view as the statistical carnage that goes into our actual distributional data. And so I'm going to give you uh, uh, my version, which I'm going to call the DAM diagram. Not, that doesn't actually stand, anything, stand for anything. It's just you know, sort of once you kind of visualize all this way, you sort of look at it and go, oh, damn. So that's why it's called that. But so we've got this abiotic niche that we'd like to estimate here, the big blue thing. And then we've got a whole bunch of other processes that can be correlated with the environment that really negatively impact our ability to infer that thing. So the first of those, which I think we don't think about often enough or clearly enough, is, is just that the world is not a full and complete and unbiased subset of environment space or, or, or sampling of environment space. It's actually quite a biased and incomplete subset of that space. And as a result, there's only a subset often of the species niche that we can collect any data about at all. So there can be combinations of environmental conditions that a species can tolerate that aren't present in the real world in the present day and age. And not only can we not collect occurrence data for our species there, even if we sample them exhaustively, we can't even collect absence data or pseudo-absence data or background data from those areas of environment space because there is no there there. Um, and as a result, there are areas of environment space about which our models are fundamentally incapable of being informative as we're building them. So you got that, that's a problem. And then you've got your biotic interactions, which take a chunk out of what you can infer, and your dispersal limitations. And then you got your spatial sampling bias. Uh, here it's represented by roads, obviously. Uh, and then you've got metapopulation effects, which can be sort of positively misleading about the niche, because they can cause you to have occurrence data that's not within the fundamental niche. And then you've got just the sort of uh, stochastic effects of sampling and all of that. So you've got all these processes going into your data that can be environmentally correlated. And again, if you sort of look at what you're trying to estimate and look at what your data looks like in this cartoon here, you just kind of go, well, we're not going to build a great model there, probably, no matter how hard we try. Um, but that's not the point here. The point I'm trying to make is there are a bunch of processes that go into generating occurrence data. And the question of what sorts of models we're building, whether we're building distribution models or niche models, I think fundamentally comes down to what we're trying to make these models represent. Yes, they contain a whole bunch of phenomena that, that, that drive the distribution. But I want to look at sort of what the logic of building these sorts of models and using them like we use them implies about what we think these models are. So first and foremost, I want to get this out of the way. The patterns we're generalizing uh, that we're trying uh, to extrapolate from are not, well, the data is spatial, but the models aren't inherently spatial. If we actually just wanted to generalize the spatial pattern in our data, there's really no reason to go through the environment to do that. We can actually make a spatial generalization of our data that doesn't require most of any of the assumptions that we have to make when we're building a niche model. We don't typically do this for the sorts of applications that we build niche models for, and there's a really good reason, which is that they're useless uh, for a lot of the things that we use niche models for. So I'm going to talk about this stuff in the context 
of predicting a species ability to invade a new continent. So if we were to build a strictly spatial, spatial model, such as a convex polygon or local, localized convex hole or interpolated density surface, something like that, what would happen if we tried to project that to a new continent? Well, obviously nothing. It basically, a strictly spatial model is only going to say that our species will be where it is and won't be where it isn't. And so it's not informative when we think about the effects of climate change or uh, a projecting to a different geographic region. So obviously, the model we're building is not a spatial model, even if the input occurrence data is spatial. So when we build a model for a species and try and project it to a new continent, we're saying there's some meaning about that species distribution with respect to its environment that we can then transfer to that new continent. So as I said, there's a bunch of different phenomena that go into generating this relationship between a species and its environment. So let's look about, uh, at those phenomena and one by one and let's ask, is there any logical reason to expect that we're going to get meaningful transferability of the environmental correlates of each of those phenomena from the native range to uh, this uh, uh, new continent that we're talking about here? Okay. So what about historical biogeography? So here we're not talking about the environmental correlates uh, of, of dispersal. We're talking about just the history in the native range. Do we expect the environmental correlates of that history? Uh, this is kind of hard to phrase, but, but I'm talking about the species being where it is because of the history, but not necessarily because of the niche. Uh, uh, if that's clear. This is the sort of stuff we were talking about in that tree paper that, that, that came out last uh, July, I think it was. Do we think that those things, these strictly historical phenomena, uh, are going to be transferable to the, new, to the new area? And the answer is, of course, no, because the history doesn't exist in a new area. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense to do that. Um, biotic interactions also, I don't think, are transferable. Uh, uh, or the environmental correlates of biotic interactions necessarily because the species with which they had those interactions in the native range may not exist in the place they're being introduced to. And so even if there are fairly similar species in the new uh, uh, continent here, there's no guarantee the biotic interactions are going to be similar and there's no guarantee that the environmental correlates of those biotic interactions are going to be similar. So there's really no a priori reason to think that building a model like this that's sort of parameterizing our, our biotic interactions via the environment is going to be meaningfully transferable. And to make clear, when I say these things aren't going to be transferable, I don't mean it's not going to affect the model and the predictions it makes in the new area. What I mean is there's no reason to expect those effects to be meaningful biologically and expect them to be leading us to the correct answer about where our species is going to be able to invade. Spatial sampling bias, well, again, that will affect what we predict in new area, but it's not going to be meaningful in terms of uh, predicting where our species is going to go. Um, Metapopulation dynamics, I don't know. Maybe, but probably if they are, that's more about the niche than the metapopulation dynamics directly. I don't know. That one's kind of a push. Uh, stochastic effects, of course not. But now we get down to the meat of it. If there is a meaningful relationship between the environmental tolerances and preferences of our organism in our native range, if there's some meaning to the fact that it's down towards the white end of that climb in a native range, and if that meaning is sort of intrinsic to the species and its tolerances or preferences, then we actually could essentially transfer uh, uh, that meaning, if we can infer it, to the new area. So out of all those processes, I think the one that is most clearly something that we could model and transfer to this new continent is the environmental tolerances and preferences of the organism. And we'll, we will be good at predicting its ability to invade to the extent that that's what we're able to model. To put this another way, we're building these models under one set of conditions for all those different phenomena that go into our spatial data. And then we're projecting them into a set of conditions under which the only thing that necessarily holds constant is the species itself. So in order to even undergo that research program, we have to make this fundamental assumption 
It's like it's a fundamental assumption of niche modeling you cannot get away from. For this research program to even make sense, you have to assume that that model estimates some aspect of the species relationship to its environment, be they tolerances or preferences, that is intrinsic to the species and is consistent across time and space. And I'm not saying that assuming that can't be problematic, because often it can. I just don't see how you can even go into this research program unless you can choke down that assumption and own it. And now let's sort of go to that italicized uh, portion there. Some aspect of the species relationship to its environment is intrinsic to the species and consistent across time and space. That's what you got to have. And if you don't want to call that the niche, don't call it the niche. That's fine. But I think we don't actually have a better word for it in English than niche currently. And uh, it certainly doesn't sound like a distribution. But you can call it a distribution if you want. I'm not going to yell at people for calling them distribution models. But I do want to make clear that the very construction and application of these models is contingent upon your ability to accept that this is at least partially what they mean, that they mean this close enough to make projections from them meaningful. Okay, so that's my really big push for the niche being what we're modeling, and I, I hope that was somewhat convincing. But now we get to what I consider the fundamental question of any scientific endeavor, which is who cares? Uh, why did I spend so much time on that? The next thing I'm sort of going to get to is why I think you should. Because if we're trying to model that thing, if we're trying to model the environmental tolerances and preferences of the organism that are intrinsic to the species and consistent across space and time, we're kind of doing bits of it wrong. Um, and I think if nothing else useful comes out of this particular talk, what I would like people to think about is in any given modeling effort, when you sit down to do it, think about whether you're better off having an estimate of the niche or having an estimate of the distribution with all those other phenomena. This is not the question of whether or not you can get a good estimate of the niche. This is which would you prefer to have. Would you like to know about the suitability of habitat above and beyond what biotic interactions this personal limitation do? Um, or would you like to have all that stuff sort of folded into your model via spurious correlations between those processes and the environment? And if the answer is that you would rather be modeling the niche, and I think in most cases it is, I mean, there certainly there can be cases where you're, you would prefer to have a distribution model, but I think in most cases, partic particularly when we're talking about uh, extrapolation or even interpolation in very uh, seriously undersampled areas, if you're better off having a model of the niche, then we hit the underappreciated problem that I think lies at the center of niche modeling as an endeavor. And that's this thing we call objective functions. And I say underappreciated, not unappreciated. So I know a lot of people have worried about this. Rob Anderson has, Lobo has. There's a really good chapter in the Peterson et al. book on this sort of stuff. But the real, I think, core issue here is this objective function, which, okay, an objective function is basically anything that tells you how good your model is at doing what you want your model to do. So in our case, an objective function tells us, the objective functions we use basically tell us how well our models match our distributional data. So the objective functions we have are kind of at odds with the actual goal of our modeling process if the goal of our modeling process is to model those environmental tolerances and preferences of the organism. And that includes pretty much all of them. So AUC, TSS, Kappa, AIC, all of them are basically based on how well your model fits the species distribution. So let's go back to what our data looks like. And we'll sample some presence data. That's these green points here. Um, and we'll have some absence data, pseudo-absence data, background data, whatever you, you like. And that's these red minus signs there. What if we build a perfect model of the species distribution so that the model is now orange? So that model, under our objective functions that we use, that model is perfect. It's beautiful. It uh, tells you our species should be where it is and shouldn't be where it isn't. And so we get a really good AUC score or whatever you like. 
Whereas if we actually had a perfect model of the niche that actually knew the truth of what our species could tolerate, it might get a really low score because it's saying our species could live in some places where it currently doesn't and shouldn't be in some places where it currently is because we've got sink habitat. So that would get a really bad AUC score comparatively. And yet, I think for most of the things, or at least a lot of the things we apply these models to, that's a much, much better model. So we've got objective functions that reward often exactly the wrong thing. And it's common to think that using a, a, these objective functions on independently or so randomly withheld test data will get you away from that problem. But it won't get you away from much of it. Certainly it'll help you with stochastic effects and stuff like that. But if there are environmental signals of those other non-target phenomena, so if there's an environmental signal to the biotic interactions, the dispersal limitation, the spatial sampling bias, and all that sort of stuff, that is consistent across your data, holding aside that randomly withheld test data isn't going to do you any good because you'll still be rewarding a model that fits those non-target phenomena because they're consistent across your data. So that's really potentially quite problematic. And, and again, this is something people have talked about before, but I think the problem is it's, it's not, I think it's, it's often not appreciated how deep it goes, or at least I get the feeling from talking to people it's not appreciated how deep it goes. So in any given empirical study, this problem could lead you to choose a model that's not as good as the best model in your candidate set. And you could underestimate um, the distribution of suitable habitat giving climate change or something like that. And that's a problem. But something I don't think people talk about as much are the more systemic issues, which is that we have a huge body of methodological work where people have figured out how to best choose your predictor variables or your study area or your modeling algorithm or all that sort of stuff. But they figure that out mostly by optimizing those same objective functions that could be misleading about the thing we actually want out of our models. So we may actually be by and large, making modeling choices uh, um, that are wrong for the thing we actually want out of our models, based on, again, this methodological literature that's using the wrong objective functions. So why are we doing this? I mean, that's obviously the question. If, if the problem is potentially that dire, why are we doing this? Well, it's not because we're stupid. I mean, you know, there's a lot of really, really, really smart people in this field, and again, this sort of issue has been brought up before. The problem is we don't really know what else to do. So we build these models primarily because for a whole lot of species, the distributional data is what we've got. We don't have physiological experiments. Um, uh, and we often can't do them. You can't raise a bunch of elephants in little boxes and ask what they can tolerate in terms of temperature and precipitation and stuff. So, so a lot of times this is all we've got. So, what do we do? Uh, <laughs> well, I think the solution is if we're going to get better at this, we're actually going to have to figure out uh, um, other criteria by which to evaluate our models. And we're going to have to change how we think about good versus bad models. So this is what I think is in the future of niche modeling. Um, I think we're going to have to figure out ways to build models that use distributional data but to leverage other data sources to get us better models of the niche. And we're going to have to work on ways of modeling things like dispersal and biotic interactions separately if we want to actually do a good job of distributions using good estimates of the niche. Because currently we're including those things in our models via what may be entirely spurious correlations with environmental variables that are unrelated to those processes. So. Easier said than done, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about some possibilities there. So one possibility is, uh, you know, this isn't really including another data source, but it's, a, it's adding another objective function or another criterion here, which is just model simplicity. So I've done some work on this uh, with Steph Seifert, which, which uh, a lot of other people have used. Uh, I'm using information criteria on accent models 
um, which is actually kind of a weird thing to do. And we said so in the paper where I first sort of announced this uh, method and made it available. It's sort of a weird thing to do philosophically. It's also a weird thing to do statistically because there's this sort of mismatch between the uh, uh, number of parameters and the degrees of freedom with these maxed models that mean that AIC is kind of probably over-penalizing uh, 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 parameters uh, in maxed models. But we sort of chuck it out there because uh, we, th we, we, we think it's, it's better than just setting it at the defaults and letting it go, which at least at the time was what, was what almost everyone was doing. Um, so given, I mean, I, I think AIC is, is useful in this aspect. Even if you don't like AIC, there's a lot of good reasons to think that you should at least look at what complexity gets you in your models and throw it away if it doesn't get you much. So this is just two marginal suitability functions from some stuff I did in grad school. It's uh, uh, California tiger salamanders. I built really simple models of Maxent, and I built really complex models of Maxent. And you can see how different they are. But the real, the punchline to this little example here is that the actual spatial predictions from these models was hardly different at all. You would have to look really hard to see a difference between them. So for all those extra things we're estimating in that left model, uh, uh, we're actually not getting much in terms of spatial prediction. So I would say even if you don't like AIC, do this sort of thing because uh, uh, um, it's just the right thing to do. All right. <laughs> Another possibility, and I think this one may be kind of far future, although maybe somebody else out th is out there working on this right now. I hope so. It's, it, it's a cool idea. Is figuring out ways to introduce some actual biology into these methods. So perhaps starting with data from physiological studies, um, uh, placing informative priors on what the niche might look like and using that to inform a model that's built from distributional data. So you start with a prior based on physiological studies in your group or something like that. And then you throw your distributional data in that, into that, and you, on top of that, and you essentially ask, when I inform that prior with my distributional data, what do I estimate as being the niche for my species? Now, there are a lot of reasons, well, primarily one reason, that people are somewhat concerned about informative priors uh, um, in a lot, of, uh, um, uh, a lot of areas. But I think it's possible that the situation with respect to our data is so dire that informative, in some cases, that an informative prior might actually get us a much, much better estimate than we can do without it. So I think this is at least worth exploring. Um, Nick Motsky and I have talked a bit about working on uh, something like this in the distant future, but uh, as far as I know right now, there's not this sort of method out there. I'd love to be told if there is, but yeah. But this is the place where I actually am working right now. Um, which is incorporating evolutionary history into uh, uh, estimating the niche, uh, either directly or, or somewhat indirectly. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second. Okay. So as Town mentioned, my kind of first introduction to this literature um, was basically using these methods and developing methods for using these models as niche estimates and studies of the evolution of niche across, across clades. And there's been a big literature on that. And um, there are some problems with some of those methods and, and kind of concepts which we outlined in the tree paper from last year again. Um, but I think it's pretty uncontroversial to say if you sort of take the aggregate of all those studies that, that sometimes the niche is pretty darn conservative. And other times it's probably not, because we've got other studies showing that they can get significant differences between lineages within a single species. Even if you want to disregard all of that niche modeling literature, we've now got these physiological studies, such as this one by Kellerman et al., where they've done the physiological experiments on an entire clade of organisms. And you can see here, right within this one tree, like this clade, uh, the maximum thermal tolerance is, is, is not moving at all. And then you come over here, and it seems to be changing quite a bit. So rates of niche evolution just across this tree with respect to the maximum thermal tolerance, quite variable, from, from quite conservative to fairly labile. 
So, if the niche can be very conservative, or if it can be very labile, it kind of raises the question why we would assume in any given modeling effort a priori that the species is the appropriate taxonomic scale for modeling. Because it's quite possible that it's not. It's quite possible we're modeling apples and oranges together or giving a bunch of different apples different models. That's a terrible metaphor, but there you go. Um, so I would, I'm sort of currently working uh, with Nick Motsky, Rob Lanfear, uh, um, Matthew Mosquick, and Dan Rosauer on sort of methods for trying to, to deal with this sort of uh, um, idea. So we're going to go back to the BAM diagram. Um, so it's pretty obvious why, from an evolutionary perspective, that's an interesting question to ask. But what I think may be slightly less obvious is how much potential value there could have in the modeling process by just kind of asking that question. So here we go. We've got our BAM diagram. This is our species abiotic niche we'd like to know something about. And then this is, you know, what our data looks like because we've got this biotic and mobility limitations on the abiotic niche. What if we can get nature to whisper in our ear and say, there's a sister species or just another species that has effectively the same abiotic tolerances? Well, that's, that's not nothing because our focal species can have one set of biotic and mobility restrictions and our, non, our other species can have a completely different one. And if we knew somehow that it was the appropriate thing to do, we could pool data from those two sources and build a better model for either species uh, um, a niche than we could build for each one alone. And that could have huge conservation implications. So here I've got like a little cartoon example. Um, four cloud island salamanders. Um, each one is on top of its own mountain. But since this is just my cartoon example, I'm going to tell you they all actually have the same fundamental niche. Uh, every one of these species could live on every one of these mountains, but speciation was allopatric, and they don't like the valleys, and so everyone just stays on their own mountain. So they're all the same in terms of their environmental niche, but there's a climb here, right? Because there's always a climb if you go in any direction far enough. So if we were to build models for each of these species just based on their distributional data, because there's that cline, we would build models that were distinct in environment space. So the blue species is here and the red species is here, etc. Now, if your question was, when you started this modeling process, if your question was, where should I go look for my blue species today, then that model is perfect. Because it tells you, go look for it on the blue mountain and don't bother with those other three. And same for the red species, and same for the yellow species, and same for the purple species. If your question is, where could that species live, however, those species-specific models are, are terrible because they're telling you that each species can only live on its own mountaintop, and that's just not true. And, you know, if, this is, if that's all that your question is, where could my species live, uh, then maybe you sort of call it a day and you're slightly sad about that, but you don't see it as a huge problem. But what if you're using these models to plan for the effects of climate change? And what if climate change moves those mountaintops into areas of environment space that are in the interstices between those species-specific models? Well, then those models are going to tell you that none of those mountains are good for any of those species, when in fact all those mountains are good for all of those species. So you could potentially fail to conserve the most suitable, maybe even the only suitable habitat for those species by building your models at the wrong taxonomic scale, whereas an appropriate model that treated all those species as interchangeable, that somehow knew that was the right thing to do, would give you the right answer and not have the sort of problematic outcomes. So obviously the hard thing is to get nature to whisper in our ear and tell us whether that's the right thing to do or not. Uh, nature is unfortunately not very forthcoming with that sort of information. Um, so that's what we're trying to work on. So my little chunk of this is all sort of based on trying to come up with, with methods for asking that question. Can we model these things better together or separately? So this first pass is based on GLIM in R. We're hoping to incorporate other methods and stuff like that. But we're just going to use information criteria on these GLIMs to ask uh, questions about partitioning our data, basically. So we ask whether we build separate models for those two species. Are they better at predicting the species distributions 
than a model built jointly using the data. And I'm using the same presence and pseudo absence data on both sides of that comparison. So there you go. And this is a first pass. This is very much an ongoing research program. Um, but I'm going to show you a worked example. This is Dan Rosauer's data. Um, this is data on uh, Phyllurus. This is a genus of uh, leaf-tailed geckos in eastern Australia. Um, so there's these six northern lineages. They're sort of narrow-range endemics. There's this guy here, this, the most southern of those very narrow-range ones, called Cabby Cabby. Uh, there's this very far southern lineage. It's very broad-ranging called Phyllurus platurus. Um, and you can see, so it's, it's quite far south compared to everyone else. It has a much, much broader range. So we're basically going to take that AIC-based approach and ask uh, whether or not we should treat these things together or separately. <clears throat> so first, I'm actually just going to check these guys up in environment space and do some visualization to kind of give you an idea of, of what the data looks like. So this is just the top two PC axes of the bioclim variables, because again, this is just uh, a, a trial run here, basically. So you can see Platurus is here on its own, uh, pretty much, with some overlap with Cabby Cabby, at least uh, uh, in, along PC1. It's pretty much off on its own with Cabby Cabby. I know six northern ranges are sort of stirred together at the other end of PC1. We can start off by just using k-means clustering and asking how many clusters there are in our data. And when we do that, we see uh, we've got strong support for two clusters, a little less support for three, a little less support for four, and then it really kind of drops off. So I'm just using this as a first pass to ask how many clusters we might want to consider. So we'll, we'll sort of look at those sorts of solutions that are two or three clusters. All right. So what do those clusters look like? Again, I'm not doing the AIC thing yet. I'm just doing some visualization here. Well, if you do two cluster solution using k-means clustering, you get Platurus and Cabby Cabby together, and you get those, those six northern lineages together. And if you allow it to make more clusters, it just starts splitting up Platurus and does more and more and more of that. And then it starts splitting the northern lineages, but not even along species boundaries. And so if you wanted to, for just the sake of simplicity, say we don't want to go below the species as a taxonomic unit for this study, uh, you're kind of stuck with from the k-means clustering, um, the two-cluster solution. But we're going to use our AIC-based approach now. So what happens if we treat all eight species separately? And again, this is what we would typically do in this sort of study without even asking the question. We get a joint AIC of 420. Now remember, a lower AIC score is better. So now we're going to chuck all the filurus in together. We're going to say a filurus is a filurus is a filurus and we're just going to treat them all as one and see what happens to the AIC. And the answer is we get a delta AIC of 141, which is a very significant improvement in uh, model, model quality. So, great. Already, AIC is telling us we shouldn't be treating all these things separately. So what about those two and three cluster solutions? Let's try a three cluster solution. So the six species on their own, uh, uh, Platurus on its own, Cabby Cabby on its own. We get a delta AIC from that of 13 and a half, which is a pretty big jump in model performance again. And then we can ask what happens if we chuck Cabby Cabby in with Platurus, and we get another delta AIC of 10. So we're doing better yet again by chucking uh, Cabby Cabby in with Platurus. However, just to explore, we chucked in Platurus with uh, uh, the Northern Ranges as well, and we kind of got the same answer. So we kind of sort of can't tell which one of those are better. Okay. So starting from hypotheses that we generated by clustering, we, we find the best models. Um, have the northern and southern lineages with Cabby Cabby being kind of uh, intermediate and then not being clear where that belongs. But we don't have to just do that based on clusters. We can actually incorporate evolutionary history directly. So we can use the phylogeny and we can ask, so A and B are sister species, which if we believe the niche might be conservative, means we might actually want to ask first whether they should be treated together or separately. So we can ask that question, and then we can do that for C and D as well. And if the method tells us A and B should be pooled and C and D should be pooled, we can move deeper in a tree and ask if A, B, C, D should be pooled. So we can treat the phylogeny as a series of nested hypotheses about which things should be pooled and which things should be kept separate. So we'll do that. So we got our tree here. This one doesn't have cabby cabby in it, 
uh, directly, so, so we're going to ignore that one. We're going to ask whether these two northern lineages should be pooled, and AIC says, yes, they should. Then we're going to ask whether Platurus and Amnicola here should be pooled. So remember, Platurus is that far southern one. And the answer is, is no, it should not be pooled with Amnicola because it's one of those northern ones. We can go up into this other clade here and we can ask sort of deeper in a tree, should we pool things or keep them separate? And it just says pool and pool and pool and pool. So again, we're getting all those normal lineages should be together. But we've got one of them down here with Platurus because of just the structure of the tree. So if we go to the root of the tree and say, should we pool everything? It's actually quite ambiguous uh, in terms of the AIC scores. You really don't get a strong signal that you should do this as compared to treating this, these five modern lineages and Amnicola and Platurus each as a separate thing. We could just let Platurus be an environmental autapomorphy, essentially chuck out the tree to some extent. And of course, that's the best answer, but we knew that from the clustering approach. So we end up with a very similar answer, um, particularly if we allow that environmental autapomorphy. Um, and it's really cool because I feel like in this sort of eight species scenario, you could exhaustively explore uh, all the different sort of clustering approaches, or, or sorry, all the different sort of sets you could cluster and all that sort of stuff. But in a much larger clade, you really probably couldn't do that. And so using the phylogeny as kind of a guideline for initial hypothesis testing actually could be quite useful, as well as having a sort of clear evolutionary interpretation that makes you feel really happy when it pans out. <laughs> So that's the first pass, like I say. This is something we're, we're very much working on right now. The initial plan was to have an R package out by this point, but uh, uh, that hasn't happened because, uh, um, well, I'll tell you why in a minute, but uh, um, we're working on it. It'll be longer than we thought it was. So the next step is actually to allow us to partition parameters or variables by clade instead of uh, uh, partitioning entire models by clade. So you remember those... Uh, eight species were pretty much identical, actually, along PC2. It was really just PC1 along which they're distinct. So it's quite possible we want to have uh, um, a clade-wide response to PC2, but still have some species-specific responses along PC1. And eventually, we're going to be able to do that. Uh, um, but that's very much in development, and we don't have an example of that to show you yet. We could actually also just take the distributional data and try to build a model of the evolution of the niche across the entire clade. So evolving those parameters in the context of the tree as opposed to just asking where we should make breakpoints. And this is very much Matsky's thing. I, I'm helping with it, but that's very much his project. Uh, uh, the partitioning thing is, is sort of more my project. So this is actually why the uh, R package for doing this stuff is nowhere near being complete, is, is because once we started talking about this stuff, we realized the, maybe not the first thing, but one of the most important things we've got to do is we've got to do a simulation study on this stuff to evaluate the performance of these methods and compare it to traditional methods in a realizable case where we know the truth of the niche, but we also have all of those other, pro, uh, those, those other processes that can, can contribute to distributional data confounding our ability to infer the niche. So we need to make realistically crappy data and use that to evaluate these methods. And I'll get to why we really, really have to do that. Then our final goal is to validate uh, these methods against data from physiological experiments, such as the Kellerman et al. Uh, experiments, to examine the performance of these methods under real world conditions where we do have some knowledge about the niche from uh, non-distributional data across an entire clade of organisms. But the hard bit is just getting people to get away from this idea that this is a better model than this one. That, again, there are some questions where maybe that is a better model, uh, like if you just want to know where to go out and find more of your species. But I think for a lot of this stuff, certainly the most difficult stuff that we use these models for, this, this model is much better even if it doesn't parameterize or doesn't match the distribution particularly well. And that's why we have to do those simulation studies. Because we have to try to convince people that our models are getting this and that that's accurate. 
um, uh, uh, when people are used to seeing this and thinking of that as a good model. So that's what we're working on right now, generating realistically crappy data. And it's way more difficult than you would think. Oh, the reason it's more difficult is we have to get realistically crappy data that has evolved as well. So we have to have the evolutionary and biogeographic history simultaneously along with biotic interactions and dispersal limitations and spatial sampling bias. So getting all those things simultaneously is difficult, to say the least. All right, so that's what we're doing. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the work example. I promise in a year or so it will be much more impressive, <laughs> but, but it's neat anyway. Uh, um, at least I think so. So the take-home message. The ways in which we build and apply these models, to me at least, make it pretty clear that the intent is to model the niche, uh, even if the, that ends up being confounded by the effects of the distribution uh, most, if not all the time. I really feel like we're reaching the limits of how well we can do with the current distribution-centric approach. So at this point, we've got a good dozen or so, maybe two dozen, maybe five dozen, um, high-dimensional correlative methods that allow us to take distributional data and fit arbitrarily complex models to it. Um, I don't think the next massive leap forward in the quality of models we're able to make is going to come from yet another high-dimensional correlative method uh, that does that stuff. And I don't really think we're going to get a whole lot better just by fine-tuning the approaches we've got with the methods we've got. I think we're, we're not up against what we're getting close to, the limitations that are inherent in the data. And, uh, um, you know, and that, that's, that's kind of good because it means we're doing our job. We've done a lot of exploration of the methods here. But it also means that if we do want to take a, a, a leap forward as opposed to an incremental step forward, uh, um, we've got to get away from just using distribution data. And that's going to require a lot more work than I think we're used to putting in these models. And I think the future of niche modeling is the integration of distributional data with other data sources. Certainly, I'm far from the only person thinking this. There's a lot of cool stuff going on out there. But uh, um, yeah, this has just been my little slice of it I've been talking about. And uh, finally, this is another one take home. I really want to bash home there. If you agree or if you feel that in any particular study you're doing, your intent is to model the niche and that your end goals will be better suited by modeling the niche than they would by modeling the distribution. You need to be uh, uh, aware of the fact that the, the objective functions we typically use in this literature may be giving you the wrong thing. And, and explore models that those objective functions may say are not as good because uh, they may actually be better estimates of the thing you're actually trying to get. So there you go. Those are the big take-homes. And uh, um, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dan. That was great. Thanks. <clears throat> so a couple of questions have come in. Uh, oh. I'm going to... I'm. I've already posted these questions on the Google Plus page for you. Um, but um, these are coming from Monica Papish, who's an uh, assistant professor at Oklahoma State University. Um, and Mona is asking, um, I'm, I'm picking one of the four. Uh, in the multiple species study, is the cluster, the pooled species modeling, uh, performing better because the signal, some sort of environmental tolerance, is stronger when the taxa are clustered. In other words, are you getting at the tolerance through your modeling approach? Um, I, I certainly hope so. That's the goal. Um, fundamentally, now I think, right now we don't know that. Um, what it says definitely is we can do it as good a job we, we can do as good a job modeling a bunch of those species together with a lot less parameters than we can modeling each of them separately. Whether that's actually getting us closer to the fundamental niche there, we don't know because we don't know the fundamental niche for those organisms. Ultimately, that's what the, 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 the uh, simulation study uh, and the comparison of those physiological data sets is, is going to be for. 
We're, we hope that's true, but um, we don't really know. Uh, and a point I wanted to make, actually, this whole idea of penalizing uh, complexity in favor of simplicity, and this is true if you're, even if you're modeling a single species and using AIC or even sort of eyeballing it based on uh, uh, those uh, um, marginal suitability functions or whatever. Um, that whole idea is predicated on the hope um, that uh, the niche is the dominant for shaping the relationship of your distributional data to the environment. So if the strongest thing going on in your data there is actually the, say, dispersal limitations or the, or the environmental signal dispersal limitations, then getting a simpler and simpler model is actually going to get you closer to that, not to the environmental niche. And so even, you know, I, I do think penalizing model complexity is a really good thing to do however you want to do that. But realize that even, even doing that, there is at the core of it um, something that amounts to a hope that your data means what you think it means. <laughs> yeah. And that's true in this, that, that multi-species stuff as well. Great. Thank you. Um, and then from Jorge Soberon, um, here at the University of Kansas. Uh, Dan, thanks for this interesting talk. I wonder if you think that the weird shapes of available environmental spaces should also be taken into account at the time of developing a better methodology for niche models. And then he notes, and by the way, yes, some people are already working on a Bayesian approach to modeling a fundamental niche using a priori information. Awesome. Um, again, his question is about uh, sure. taking into account the the irregular shapes of environmental spaces. Um, yes, ideally, I think that would be a very very nice thing to do. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me how you would do that, but I would say that that it's one of the, one of the few ways I think we could be say useful things in those empty areas of environment space is if we had uh, 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 strong priors that we thought were reliable. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, if we actually had a prior from physiological study for a given species saying we know it can survive out to 40C or whatever, but our environment space in the, in the, the, the region we're training it in is only currently going to 36 or whatever, then uh, um, that prior, I'm sorry, that, that, that prior could actually give us a model that's meaningful out there even though uh, um, the environment isn't actually extending up. So, yeah. I'd love to hear more about that Bayesian method though. If, yeah, we should talk about that. Okay. Yeah, I know uh, Jorge and colleagues have been, have been plugging away at, at, at getting these, these methods um, developed and taking into account those environmental spaces, which is admittedly a, a tough yeah. network. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, one thing about that, and, and also about this sort of clustering method is, so one of the things I think our joint share of literature makes clear more than almost any other literature I can think of, maybe if I the next literature, is that the adoption of tools is driven by how accessible they are as much as it is by how good they are. We're very fortunate that the most accessible tool we've got is also a really, really good one. But it's, I don't think, a coincidence that this whole literature took off, you know, right around when Maxent became widely available and widely advertised. Um, it's a beautiful piece of software. It's very easy to use. And I think uh, uh, it's incumbent upon those of us who develop methods to actually make them accessible. So. If we come up with a cool Bayesian method like that, or we come up with a, a cool clustering method like this one or whatever, if we fundamentally don't make that accessible to people who don't have eight months to figure out how to use our arcane code or whatever, it's never going to be adopted. So I, I think uh, uh, one of the harder problems is when we make this process of building a model more complex, we have to figure out how we'll make that accessible to, 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 to end users. And that, that's a, a whole other set of problems that... Uh, uh, um, we're really going to have to struggle with, I think. And a much broader problem than just niche modeling. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's a, across, I think, probably all sciences, but certainly evolution ecology, yeah. Okay. Well, then there may be additional uh, questions coming in, and you know, if you have the time and energy, 
uh, take a look at the Google Plus page for this event. And you know, again, if you have time and energy, wonderful to get your answers. Um, but more generally, thank you very much for the middle chunk of your night. And, uh, I'll look forward to seeing you in person at some point again. Right. Thank you, too. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for watching. See you later. And everybody, you've got another seminar coming up in a month. I believe it's March 26th, but I'll, I'll post the details of the time, and that will be uh, Dr. Darren Kritikos talking about the Climund, um, Climate Archive. So, again, thank you, Dan, and good night, Dan, and, and good morning, everybody on this side of the world. Right on. <laughs>